Praise God. All right. Well, it's good to be with the people of God tonight. Uh, I, uh, I know some of you know that I, Sister Smith and I were uh, at Brother Bud's funeral and we're in Nacogdoches there for a week or eight days and um of course, we saw a lot of people in the at the funeral, and but we did go to Houston on. Uh, I'm adjusting my iPad. Excuse me. We did go to Houston on um, um, thir last Thursday night. A week ago tonight, and um, <clears throat> brother, we were. Briefly, I uh, was in contact with Brother Chad Wright. Just really seconds, we both had on our mask and all, but um, then I learned Friday morning that Brother Chad became ill and tested for COVID and was positive. So, so to be extra precautious, we decided to, co you know, to uh, quarantine. So. Uh, we don't have any symptoms. We're, we're just doing fine. I appreciate everyone's prayers. I've had phone calls that people heard that I had uh, COVID-19, me and Sister Smith, but we do not have, and we're not sick at all. But we just wanted to be extra precautious and not, you know, be sure that we didn't bring anything home to our people here <clears throat> in Little Rock Church. So... We're thankful to the Lord that we're doing good, and uh, that it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem like that we have any any issues. Uh, they say that almost all people who are in contact with COVID nineteen have uh, symptoms within two to five days, but you can have symptoms up to fourteen days, even though it's rare. So. We're, we're seven days, or I guess today, today would be set eight days. Actually, tonight would be eight days since I was in brief contact. Sister Smith wasn't, but of course she's been in contact with me. So we're thankful that we haven't had any issues. Uh, there has been some new confirmed, confirmed cases in the Houston, it's assembly. There, thank the Lord that there are mild cases as of right now. Brother and Sister Shaw, uh, Clyde Shaw and his wife, uh, and then also his son Sam and, and his wife Gina also have COVID. And, and uh, I think they're doing pretty good from what I understand. So Shaw's feeling better today. I talked to him a couple of days ago. He was feeling worse at that time, but I got a report that yesterday he was feeling better. I haven't talked to anyone today, but hopefully he's doing fine. Please, everyone, keep praying for the Shaw family in Jerseyville, Illinois. This, um, you know, this COVID uh, virus is is um, it's almost like we're fighting a ghost. You know, we don't have any idea. It almost even seems that way with the uh, our medical people, even though they're learning more and more about it all along. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have to know, you know, God is in control of everything. And so, you know, you could look at this and say, well... Um, uh, it's just something that happens in the world. We've had all kinds of epidemics for many, many years, and you know we've we 
we've suffered through those epidemics had had some great losses and some uh, losses that were less great, but they were all they were all horrible. Anytime you lose you lose someone over an epidemic, uh, it's a sad situation. However, at this time, I have to believe that. Uh, we are so nearing the end of the Gentile world and knowing enough about God and the word of God that I know that the Lord's in control of everything. Uh, even though chance happeneth to every man, Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, he also mentioned that in the day of adversity, consider, you know, and so I think we do have to consider the time we're living in, the uh, time frame of God's timetable. We know that the Lord, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to talk on it tonight, but I may talk on the uh, judgment seat of Christ in the near future <clears throat> because it, uh, the eternal judgment. Well, that's one of the major four doctrines of the Bible. That we go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of faith, <coughs> uh, repentance and dead works, <coughs> and of the doctrine of baptisms, the doctrine of laying on the hands, the doctrine of the resurrection of the just, and eternal judgments. And God's eternal judgment has been administered in the early church. Uh, we've always had judgment in a measure, but eternal judgment hasn't been ministered other than in the end of the Jewish world. That's when God eternally judged both far. Um, in fact, I'll give you a scripture on that. <clears throat> he, he eternally judged for, turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Um, he, he eternally judged both for life and for death. Um, and then when the church fell away, we still, the, you know, the word of God tells us that if you are either one of the two witnesses, the Old and two, the Old and New Testament, even though they prophesied in sackcloth and ashes, uh, you still would meet judgment. <clears throat> Number one, you're going to sow what you reap. That's just a natural judgment of God, uh, the judgment of reaping and sowing. Whether you, whether you reap, your judgment is you're judged a blessing. It judges you worthy of favor of God and the blessing of God, or it could judge you as far as God's, even his wrath or, you know, his displeasure. And so, uh, but there's not any, <laughs> if you hear that was, that was Brutus, uh, the people in Nacogdoches just wouldn't hear it any other way that brother, brother Bud's dog was supposed to be that he would have wanted us to take it. <laughs> it didn't seem like we could get out of it. So so <clears throat> we've got Brutus here with us. Uh, if you go to Second Second Corinthians, the second chapter, I want to read this verse to you concerning eternal judgment uh, in the, the 14th verse, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Paul makes this statement. He says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I'm, I'm certainly longing for the day that I could make that statement. I'd like to be a part of the latter rain ministry that, that God gives us <clears throat> uh, the ability to make manifest and to triumph in Christ uh, the savor of his knowledge in every place we go. Uh, verse 15 says, For we are unto God a sweet savor unto Christ, 
in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as, uh, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So <clears throat> he was saying we're a savor uh, unto those that uh, uh, both that are saved and to them that perish. And he said the one we're a savor of life or death unto death. Somebody was asking him, Brother Scott York was working at my place today and I had a couple of trees that were dead. They'd been dying for several years and I finally decided to take them down and he he uh, he cut their roots. He couldn't quite pull them up with my tractor so he, he cut the roots down in the ground all the way around the tree and then he got a hold of the tree with the tractor and just pulled it up. Pulled it up. That's, I mentioned to him the scripture where uh, Jude said that uh, that you can be twice dead plucked up by the roots. You know, we're all dead in the trespasses of sin until we are, are born again. And then righteousness is imputed to us. Uh, while God is working uh, his righteousness in us. You know, you don't want to stay in a place where you're, where, where righteousness is imputed to you. You're counted worthy, counted righteous. Uh, read the fourth chapter of Romans. But you want to de develop to a place that you are righteous, that you have a righteous character, that you've taken on the righteousness of Christ. Uh, and God, the Father. And, uh, you know, I, sometimes I hear people say, I'm a nobody. Well, you were, may have been a nobody until God, uh, God saved you. God, uh, you were born again of God's nature. Now you are somebody. You're a child of God. And as you develop in righteousness, uh, the more quality of character you are a righteous character. And so we don't want to just be counted righteous. I mean, I thank God that I am counted righteous while, you know, I'm the covering of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross uh, covers me and I'm counted righteous by my faith, just like the same as Abraham was counted and righteousness was imputed to him. Well, under the new covenant, you still can be counted worthy through faith. But it is necessary to, to go on to perfection, go on to maturity, develop. And uh, eventually this ministry will, uh, uh, you know, somebody asked me, said, Brother Smith, what is it that we are missing that's gonna be different in a restored church? I said, I said, everything you read about in the New Testament that is a full manifestation. They had a seven-fold light. They were, they had, they had a candlestick, seven-fold light, a holy place, a second heaven condition, and that's what we're lacking. We do not have the power of God uh, that the early church had. We don't have the full seven-fold light yet. That those are some things that we are lacking, and for God to have a complete manifestation where wherever this ministry is sent by God, that we would be a a savor of God, and and we would triumph everywhere we went because we would have the the power of God. The Apostle Paul said that he was. Um, he was a uh, uh, that he it was he was with the Corinthian church in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. Well, we have a measure of that, 
but we're not, we're not, uh, uh, you know, we don't have, we're no, we don't have that in its fullness like you read about it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, getting back to this mm -hmm. coronavirus, you could say, well, it's just another epidemic that we're going to get through and life's going to get back to normal. Well, I think if you knew, if you know enough about God and you know enough about God's time frame uh, and that we are in the end of the Gentile world, uh, there's a couple things I'm looking at. Number one, uh, <clears throat> I know what we're looking at in the future. I know that uh, <clears throat> that in the end, before the end of this world, I've given out 12 things here recently that you will, uh, that has to transpire, 12 prophetical things. I can, I think I could tell, tell them to you by uh, uh, memory, but I'll just, I'll read them to you again. I'm sure that most of you have them, but uh, let me give them to you right quick. It won't take very long to do that. Number one, the church. The church has to be restored. We're in a restoration process, and I do feel like that we are in uh, the last uh, prophetical month and, and the prophetical hour coming upon us. Uh, I think that's that's something that's that it's coming and I think we're we're nearing the end to enter into that place but the church isn't fully restored yet uh, so uh, I may have to get my wife to come in here and get this dog out of here he's interrupting me so much but uh, she put him in his pen hoping that he would uh, behave but I'm and now he's kind of barking wanting out so she's gonna come get him out um after the church is restored, and as a matter of fact, most of these things are going to take place in the last prophetical hour. So a lot of things are gonna happen pretty rapidly. We're down in the foot members, or feet members, and in your feet are little bitty bones, and a lot of them. And so there's a lot of things gonna happen, and they're gonna happen in a short period of time. So. I'm just showing you what still has to happen. You know, a lot of preachers are preaching today, today that Jesus could come any time. I'm telling you, he is not coming any time. He's not coming tonight. He's not coming this week. He's not coming this month, and he's not coming this year. Uh, you have, to, if you know Bible prophecy, you'd know better than that. Uh, now, let me state this: that he may come for you or for me. You know, we lost Brother Bud here just recently. That was a total shock, not only to me, but almost everybody that knew him. He was a picture of health. Brother Brother Dennis White in their church said he's the healthiest man in our church. You know, ride a bicycle 25 miles a day, like five days a week, didn't take any medication. But this coronavirus hit him, and, and in a month, he's gone. My dearest friend that I've ever had, uh, he's closer to me, he was closer to me than a brother, and, and just all of a sudden, it's over, he's gone. That's hard to explain. I may say something more about that in a little while, but, but uh, uh, it was a great loss, and, and uh, there's some things we just, you know, we don't have a we don't have a hope. Uh, we, of, of tomorrow. Uh, that's what I was going to mention. Where Jesus told his disciples, "Your time is always. Mine's not yet come." Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think you could live and you could be chosen of God to do a great work, like the Apostle Paul or are one of the uh, 12 apostles. And I think they did get to a place where they were not gonna die until it was God's time frame. But it does look like that 
there at times God may allow someone, something can happen even natural, by chance even, and God not interrupt that. God not interfere with it. You know, I'm, I'm sure the Lord, uh, you know, watches over all of his children. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord of the death of the saints. I know God loves his children. And, um, and I do believe that his hand is on them and nothing's going to happen to them until he's ready, but he may not interfere. That's what I'm saying with, with everything we go through. Uh, anyway, let me go through these. Church re has got to be restored. There are two horned beasts in the book of Revelations, chapter 13. The two horned beasts, two horns like a lamb, speaks as a dragon, is going to... That, that beast is going to have to speak as a dragon. Okay, and then the image of the beast has to be made by the two-horned beast. Then the eighth head of the beast is given his, his given, the two-horned beast will give him his power. He'll become the eighth head. He's of the seven. Then the harvest of the Gentile world. All of this pretty well takes place and simultaneously nearly. Uh, these are events that will take place in the, either the last month or the last prophetical hour, but most of it will be in the last prophetical hour, 15 years. This harvest of the Gentile world has got to take place. Uh, God's people will be reaped out of Babylon. As re uh, the, the, the the world that God's dealing with, he will reap his people out of, but he will reap Babylon also. And uh, before he judges, but Babylon then is going to have to be judged. Babylon will be judged. That harlot will be judged. In fact, I'll give you a, a scripture in, in uh, Revelations, the sixth chapter, if you go there with me, concerning the, the souls under the altar. Let me give you that scripture. Uh, uh, it's in the sixth chapter and the ninth verse. This is, at first there was the four horses, the white horse, the red horse, black horse, and the pale horse. Then that was the four seals. Then the fifth seal in verse nine says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they shouldest rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Well, you read that. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, and so they're told, you know, they're, uh, it's like Abel's blood that cried out to God and made God aware. I mean, he was aware anyway, but, but it's just showing the condition that God was aware of, uh, of what Cain had done. Well, these people, uh, they were crying out, even though they were dead, even though they had perished, they, uh, white robes were given to them. Ninth verse, uh, chapter 19, eight shows that the white robes are the righteousness of the saints. Well, I believe they were counted worthy. They were, they didn't wash their robes and make them white, but those robes were given to them and they were, uh, they were counted righteous. But for God to uh, venge their blood, he does finally venge it after a time, after they have to rest for a time. If you'll turn to, uh, the 19th, I believe it's in the 19th chapter. See, in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations, the uh, Babylon is judged. Uh, in the 19th chapter, let's start right there. 
God gets all of his people out of Babylon, those that will come out. They won't all come out. And uh, finally, after he gets them all out, he, he judges that system. The sound of the millstones, no more heard it all in her, the voice of the bridegroom, uh, whatever craft, is, you know, the sound of musicians and pipers and trumpeters or whatever craft they were was heard no more at all in them. The voice of the bride and the bridegroom was heard no more. See, all that's working in Babylon right now. The light of the candle. Now, that's not a candlestick. Those seven churches in the early, uh, in the seven letters that John wrote, those were candlestick churches. But this doesn't say candlestick. It says the light of the candle. They had a light. They had a, a light. They do have a light down in Babylon. God's still working with those people out there. God loves his people. And he's going to save all of them that he can. But he'll have to have a restored church that will have the full uh, sevenfold light, the full manifestation and the power of God to help those people and get them out of Babylon. Then those that refuse, God will judge that system out there and then here in the 19th verse, it says, verse one, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Verse two, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of the servants of her hand, at her hand. See, God did finally avenge the blood of those under the altar back there. God finally brought vengeance. He brought, he brought judgment on that system that they suffered under and God judged the system. So, <clears throat> You know, God does, uh, you know, he's, he judges this. All this happens in God's time and uh, it, God's uh, fulfilling his purpose, his time frame. So <clears throat> um, anyway, let me go back to, I didn't really mean to take as much time. I was just going to read you these things. Uh, I said the, the Babylon has to be judged. Okay, and then number eight, the U.S. will fall. The United States, uh, it will come to a place of judgment. Uh, the United States has turned its back on God. This is the greatest nation because of God, because God called this nation as a place to restore his church. And... Uh, to establish his, the body of Jesus Christ and to, to finally restore his church. And of course, right now, it's reaching out to different countries, just like in the end of the early church, uh, the Jewish world, God was harvesting that world and he was reaching out. Uh, he was not only harvesting the Jews, but he was also reaching out to the Gentiles and bringing in the Gentiles, uh, getting them ready for the getting this message ready to go out among the Gentile world. He was going to work on a, he was going to bring this to another world. Uh, how did he tell the Jews? Jesus said this. He said, you know, he said that if you, if you spoke against Christ, you could be forgiven. But he said, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, there was no forgiveness for you, he told them, in this world or the world to come. Well, this is the world that was to come. They were those that rejected Christ and rejected the body of Jesus Christ. There was no forgiveness for that. That was blasphemy. That was the blasphemy Jesus was talking about. Those that blasphemed and, and rejected the full power and manifestation of God, God God, uh, uh, he, that, that's unforgivable. God can't forgive that. Rejecting, when you reject God, there's no forgiveness in that. And there's been no forgiveness for uh, down through these, the, this Gentile world, these 2,000, near, near 2,000 years uh, 
for the Jewish people that still reject Christ. But uh, right now what God's doing is he is reaching out and he will, according to Romans 11, he will graft the Jew back in. God will reach them. That's, there's a picture of that in, in uh, the type of Elijah, where Elijah, you know, uh, where Elijah was, was uh, he uh, challenged Ahab and the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel. And of course, you know, he, God answered his sacrifice and wouldn't answer their sacrifices. And Jezebel, uh, which is a picture of that, uh, of the religious system. And the picture is the, is the reformers. The picture of Elijah in that type is a picture of our reformers. Elisha ran from Jezebel for his life. He found a juniper tree. The juniper tree is an evergreen. And that's a picture. That It's a picture of the word of God, evergreen. It always has life in it. Uh, the ministry of the restoration. Martin Luther had to run for his life. They had a death warrant out on him. Uh, many were martyred down through the these dark ages and, and to bring about this restoration. There's been many, many of God's people suffer through that. And uh, if you remember, he laid down under a juniper tree and, and went to sleep. That's the only place they could find rest is is in the word of God. That's what that juniper tree is a picture of. And the Bible said he went to sleep. He found rest. And an angel woke him up and, and told him, said, here, eat this cake and drink this cruise of water. And uh, he did, and he went back to sleep. And he woke him up again and said, eat, eat again. This second, you know, there was, there was another cruise of water, another uh, cake that he was to eat. Those two feedings represent the Protestant and the Pentecostal uh, movements that have brought us to where we are. I think we're past the Pentecostal era now. I think we've entered into the 30 years of, uh, of uh, the uh, one of the angels loosed out of the river Euphrates. One of those time frames was a month, which is a 30 years a prophetical month. And I think that's where we are. Uh, anyway, the angel told him, said, you're going to need these feedings for your journey. And the Lord knows we've needed those feedings. We've needed everything that our forefathers got out of the Protestant movement, the Pentecostal movement. Brother William Souders was the, uh, he was the very heart, the very core of what God was doing in the Pentecostal movement. That's why God brought it, you know, he restored that part of it because it was time to restore the body of Christ and begin to form uh, the, the body, Christ's body of people in this earth. And uh, you, if you're a part of that, you are blessed. You are highly blessed among men and women in this world. And, uh, but if you remember, he went up on Mount Horeb. That was where they, he was to go. And he found a cave up there and went in the cave. The body of Christ is a picture of that cave. If you're in the body of Christ, you better stay in it because it's the only safe place there is to be. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, if you remember the winds begin to blow against the mountain, the rocks begin to break against the mountain. Listen, saints, the wind is blowing today. The four winds that are blowing civil powers, military powers, financial powers, and religious powers. They're blowing against this mountain of religion and a civil and ecclesiastical systems that's in this world, and it's breaking everything up. I've never seen the United States, our government, our leaders, I've never seen them in such a state that they're in. They could barely hold this they can't even hold their cells together, much less the world. They're in a terrible condition because they don't lean on God. They're leaning on the flesh. And uh, then after the winds, then fire and brimstone uh, came against the mountain. That's judgment. I think we're looking at judgment coming. That's why I'm looking at this 
coronavirus is something more than just another epidemic. I'm looking at it as, as uh, we're in the big middle of change. Look, we over a hundred, uh, right now over a hundred, almost 107 years, the body of Christ has never, never had to stop having meetings. We haven't had a meeting this year and we won't have one the rest of this year either. Hopefully we'll maybe have, you know, we'll have to see the flu epidemic is coming upon us and the, hopefully we will have vaccines that will help with the coronavirus. I will tell you that Dr. Fauci, which to me, he's been negative about almost everything he said, but last week I read a statement from him that was more positive than anything I've ever heard him say. And here's what he said. He said, by the end of this year, November and December, we'll have vaccines. And uh, we will go through this winter, but the vaccines will be great, a great help. And then <clears throat> by the end of 2021, this, this virus epidemic will be over and we'll get back to normal. Well, I don't know exactly what normal is going to be. Uh, I hope he's right, and I'm I'm praying that he's right. I'll have to be honest with you. I didn't think this epidemic would be as bad as it's already been when it first came out. But the more you know, we've seen what developed. The more we began to look at God, where God was in all of this. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, I'm getting back to America falling. America is uh, certainly has turned its back on the Lord. Our leaders has turned their backs on God. Uh, they're all turning to a liberal, more of a liberal state of, you know, anything goes. Um, and uh, they're not fearful of God nor God's judgment. And so I feel God, I, do, I know God will judge this nation. Uh, before he's finished this judging and there's no way that that 10 kings could come into power and America remain the uh, the superpower that it is today so that will take place um, okay so I said that there was uh, the U.S. would fall then the Jews being grafted back in I was going to mention I did mention in the 11th chapter of Romans how that they being a tame olive branch. Paul mentioned that, that, that blindness in part has happened to them. See, God, God has, uh, that's a, there's a picture in the uh, parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was, was, uh, Israel and Lazarus was, uh, the Gentile. He went into Abraham's bosom. That is his, his Abraham's the covenant that God made with Abraham. We, we Gentiles entered into the covenant, uh, uh, but, but the Jews entered into a hellish condition and God has held them there, great gulf between us and them. We can't get to them, they can't get to us. Uh, they, they wanted relief from their situation, but they hadn't been able to get it. But Hosea said that after two days, our, uh, when they see him whose side they pierced, you know, once they, God touches them and they, re, they see this, they see the body of Christ and they won't see it until there's a restored church and it'll provoke them to jealousy and they will see the body of Jesus Christ and they'll recognize. And, and the picture of that is, is that, uh, after the winds on Mount Horeb, after the, uh, the, fire. Then there was an earthquake, shook the whole world. I would say that's America falling. They went down. Then, then you know, a still small voice. See, those things were not for Elijah or the body of Christ in the cave. That was for the world. That was bringing judgment on the world. And that's what you can look for in the future. That God's going to judge this world, but remember what Peter said, judgment first must begin at the house of God. And we are going to have to be judged. We are going to have to be willing to set through judgment. It's not a bad judgment. It is, our judgment is to be 
first instructive. God instructs us and he will not judge you until you have a knowledge of what God is asking of you to live a righteous life. And then he will investigate you. God will, he'll investigate your life. The Lord will, uh, he'll begin to deal with you. Ministers will begin to talk. God will bring your case up to you. So ministers may not know that they're talking to you, but God will talk to you either through the word of God, through a ministry. He may talk to you on your bed. He may talk to you through circumstances. God will talk to his people and he will investigate your life. In other words, he'll dig down in your life and help you to know what it is in your life that you need to correct, that you need, uh, you know, and so God's judgment's not a bad judgment at all. It's then he will correct you. It, look, instructive judgment, investigative judgment, and then corrective judgment. And you can be corrected just by humbling yourself. You know, just God dealing with you and humble yourself and, and draw closer to God. What does the Bible say? He said, uh, I'm nigh them. He's nigh them that are of a, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. James said that, he resists the proud, but he draws nigh to the humble. So if we can humble ourselves and just through correction of, of instruction, investigation, and you know God dealing with us with corrective measures. Now, he does have a right to chastise you. You know, Paul said in Hebrews that he, he chastises those whom he loves. Uh, he doesn't do that like our fathers. May, they may do it for their own sakes because, you know, I want my kids to do what I want them to do. They're going to do what I want them to do or I'm going to beat them. <laughs> but that's not how God is. He does it for your sake. He wants you to know and realize what righteousness is and he wants to give you the help, the strength, the knowledge, the, the instruction of how to live a righteous life. And he gives you that help through a new birth, a new creature. Be, being born again of God's nature, you can, with God's help, you can, your mind can be changed. That's what Paul said when he said, uh, be ye renewed by the spirit of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye uh, renewed by the spirit of your mind uh, so that you might know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, when God, when God, and God will begin to renew your mind. When, it, when you, For your mind to be renewed, it means there's something that was taken away from you that needs to be redone. It needs to be renewed. In the beginning, Adam had the right mind. God gave him the right instruction, but he, but he fell. And corruption came in this world uh, in a nature, a fallen nature of man. And until Christ came, there was no new nature through this new birth. and But finally, God sent his son to reconcile man back to him. And so through this new birth and then through the renewing of your mind, you can become a righteous, you can become righteous in your character. So it may take some chastising. Trust me, I've had some chastising from the Lord I'm hoping and I'm asking God to help me to be corrected without having to go through chastisement. I don't, you know, I don't like, I never did like a whipping from my daddy and I don't like one from the Lord either. <laughs> anyway, so let me get back. I said that the U.S. would fall, the Jews would be grafted back in. God will bring them back in when the church is restored. God will begin to add, that's the picture there, uh, I was showing you on Mount Horeb how Elijah, when he came down out of the cave, he, he, he come up on a young man that was plying with 12 oxen. That's a picture of the, of the Jews, the 12 tribes. They're still working on the 12 tribes of the Jews waiting on the Messiah. And Elijah's mantle touched them. And that's a picture of the restored church's ministry touching the Jews. And when that happens, when that happened to that young man, he dropped his, he dropped his plow. He ran after Elijah. He said, I've got to follow you. And he said, what did I do to you? 
And he said, I have to follow you. Let me go home and kiss my mom and dad goodbye. And he, he went and slew the oxen. He burnt the harnessing. He, he fed the oxen to the poor and he kissed his mother and daddy goodbye and he ran after Elijah and stayed with him until Elijah was caught up on the other side of Jordan. That's a picture of the Jew being grafted back in when this restored church ministry's mantle touches. When this mantle touches uh, the Jews, God has held them in his wisdom. And I'll tell you why. It's because there's not another people on the face of this earth that could possibly keep the church from falling away or working with Christ and his bride down through the thousand years other than the Jew. Because when God finishes with the Gentiles that he's been working with for 2,000 years, there's no one else in the world. He'd have to start all over with another 2,000 years and another nation of people before he could bring them to a place of a sevenfold life and operating in God's righteousness. But when the Jew sees it, they'll get it like this. You see, they, they'll be like the apostle Paul. He was blind on the road to Damascus. But when he saw, when God knocked him down and blinded him, and he did that to show him how blind and ignorant he was of the very fact that the Messiah was there with him and he was rejecting the Messiah and rejecting God's son in the earth. But when God showed him that, he be, God opened his eyes and he saw Christ in the whole Old Testament. His 13 epistles all came right out of the Old Testament. He saw Christ and saw what God was doing. He said in the third chapter of Philippians, he said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he said of the law and without blame. But he said, I count all that loss that I might win him that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. So uh, the Lord uh, is going to graft them back in. In his wisdom, he's held them in this great gulf. When he touches them, after two days, he'll, they'll come back in. They'll come back in and they'll receive this message. Our mantle will touch them. They'll be just like that little boy. He'll, they'll say, we got to follow you. We, we, we count all of Judaism lost. We now understand and we accept the Messiah and we wanna be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. They'll come in and they'll get this message and they'll, it'll scare you how fast that they'll begin to get this because they know the law of Moses. They know the history of their father Abraham. They know the history of Israel and the prophets all the way through. This will explode in their mind far greater than it's been able to help us Gentiles because it's not exploded in our minds like that. Anyway, so uh, the, uh, the Jews will be grafted back in. The 10 kings will come into power. Uh, you know, once, once the beast, the eighth head gets its power, the 10 kings will come into power. I'm not sure. We don't have any insight in the Bible. The word, the number 10 means, uh, it means judgment. Right now I'm looking at the United Nations possibly fulfilling uh, that scripture of the 10 kings, not necessarily being a, a number of 10 actual kings, but a judgment seat. Right now, all I see, if America was to fall, and by the way, when I say America's gonna fall, I do not believe that America's going to be destroyed as a nation. It will just fall financially. It will fall militarily. I do believe there will be destruction probably on the, mo on the, uh, the, uh, on most of your coastal you know, areas where there are large military bases. I think that there will be destruction. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to answer it. Uh, part of it probably be, will come from within. Uh, and uh, so I think America will be devastated financially. I think it'll be devastated militarily. 
the government uh, will be uh, under dire, uh, in a dire condition, and our, our uh, of course, our religious system in America will fade because uh, the eighth head will uh, come into power and you'll lose uh, the Protestant Pentecostal people. The, the beast, the image of the beast will take over. Um, and so for the 10 kings to come in power, the only thing I can see if America falls is that the United Nations would probably try to bring uh, stability to the world. It's going to shake the whole world when that happens. And so uh, I, I see that uh, there will be a great shaking there. And then if it is the United Nations, they'll, they'll try to bring stability. And uh, they probably will be predominant nations of Muslims. And that probably will, uh, but they are going to give their power to the beast for an hour. I think that's probably going to be deceitfully. Uh, that's the way that religion works. And then it will eat her flesh and destroy her. Uh, the uh, For God's put it in her mind to do his will. So, and that's going to end in Armageddon. So the seven vials in the 16th, 15th, 16th chapter of the book of Revelation is going to uh, come about. And of course, that'll end in the battle of Armageddon. And then... Of course, God's judgment will finish in this Gentile world and the bride in Christ will work through that Jewish ministry down through the thousand years. So many things have got to take place, saints of God. Uh, the Bible, I mean, the bride of Christ, of course, has got to be, it's got to be finished. It'll be finished make it, being made up before the seven vials are poured out, which is probably in the last half of the last prophetical hour. So there's a lot of things gonna happen in a short period of time. Uh, so these seven vials will be poured out, like I said, ending in the Battle of Armageddon. That's number 12. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things that has to happen. Uh, and we're nearing the end of this world. Uh, so we're just gonna have to see. Uh, we're watching God. We need to be sober. We need to watch and pray. Stay in the word of God. And uh, I, I'm not trying to tell you folks that I have the answer exactly on everything. I'm just giving you my position at this time, but I do reserve the right to change if the Lord helps me to see something different. But I do think that I am giving you some very real understanding about where we're at in God's timetable. And I know I'm giving you what's correct about what has to take place in these 12 things I've mentioned. Uh, so uh, anyway, I did put on the, uh, I did put my phone number and uh, uh, put on the post there tonight that you can text me questions if you've got questions. Uh, I, you know, I, I want all of you in the body of Christ to know that I'm not, I, don't, I have no intentions of trying to uh, project something to you against what your pastor teaches. So you stick with your pastor. You, it's all right to listen and consider other men, but don't work against your pastor and accept what he teaches. God will bring his ministry together on these issues before this is over with. So uh, let's all work in order. Uh, let's love one another. You know, the 34th chapter of, of Psalms says to seek peace and pursue it. You, you can't, uh, it, peace doesn't come automatic. You have to seek it. You have to, you have to labor to have true peace. Um, uh, Somebody mentioned about Brother Leninger mentioning uh, fellowship and unity and, and love uh, and trust. And here's the way I put that is, is that you first have to have fellowship. Uh, fellowship produces, it produces trust. 
And you, you have to get to know someone. You can't trust someone you do not know. That's why the Bible says to know them that labor among you. For you to know those that labor among you in a little while, you're going to know like what one of the churches in the seven uh, letters of the, of the book of Revelation, seven letters that the churches in Asia was that they tried them that said they were apostles and found them to be liars. See, uh, God don't want us to be gullible. We're just to accept anything. And so uh, we are to uh, be, we are to be uh, keen. We're to be God is to help us and give us direction and help us to have understanding. But our fellowship with one another, if it's true fellowship and it's godly fellowship with a pure heart, it will produce love and you'll find those, uh, trust, I'm sorry, it'll produce trust. You will trust those. It's just like a husband and wife when you first start seeing each other, first start courting, that's fellowship. You have to come into a relationship first and then you get to know each other. Then you find out whether or not you have a common trust for one another. Okay, that trust brings unity. See, I can't be really in unity with you until I really know you and really trust you. And so unity finally will produce love. It, that's what it produces. The, it produces the love of God. I'm talking about godly fellowship, godly uh, trust, godly unity, and finally charity, the love of God. Uh, it also, in the 133rd, let me read it to you right quick. Psalms, uh, Psalms 133. I know y'all know this verse, but let's, let's just read it because it's a beautiful verse. It's a beautiful little chapter. It's only got three verses in it. And it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is, is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head. This is talking about God, the God's unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down on the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of the garments. That's talking about the high priest of Christ, the anointing that was on Christ. That was a picture and a type there. That, that anointing of God. <clears throat> was upon him. That's what unity, true unity of God, it produces the anointing of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, God's favor upon Christ. He said it's, it, it's as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Those were the mountains of Jerusalem. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. See, this, this, I mean, this was talking about the day of Pentecost that Christ brought that anointing in unity upon that ministry. And it, that unity and the love of God it produced brought life forevermore. So God help us. We have to seek peace. We have to seek. We have to seek when we have to stay in fellowship. And so <clears throat> you're in a good place, saints of God. You're in a wonderful place. And uh, I just want to tell everyone I appreciate you all. I appreciate your prayers. I got a phone call again uh, this morning. Someone said I heard you had coronavirus. You and your wife. We do not have coronavirus. We were, I was exposed for probably 20 seconds, not hardly real directly, not even face to face, but I was close. And uh, uh, to Brother Chad Wright in, in Humble, Texas last Thursday night, which did come down with COVID-19, uh, COVID he is doing good. Uh, I think he had a mild case and uh, We've had no symptoms whatsoever, but we did quarantine ourselves just to make sure that we weren't bringing that home uh, from Brother Bud's funeral and from the visit and the, and the 
humble church. Uh, Brother Wright's doing well. He's he had you need to pray for him. He had he went back to having treatments this week, and so we want to keep him in our prayers. And uh, as well as everyone, please keep praying for Brother Sister Shaw, uh, Brother Clyde Shaw and his wife, and 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 also for Sam and Gina. They do have COVID-19. Uh, I think they're doing pretty good. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with them, and I, my last report was is that they're feeling better, doing better, and I, and I don't think they've been, they haven't been in the hospital. To my knowledge, They I know that the, the elders haven't been, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty positive I would have known. So anyway, keep them in your prayers. Keep praying. Let's keep reaching out to God. It is a time, saints. It is a time to be sober and to watch and to pray and get close to God. Try to get closer to God. Uh, seek to get closer to him. We're living in a serious time right now. I do believe we're in the middle, right in the dead middle of change for the world. I think God's getting this world ready I think we're not too many years ahead that you'll see the, the image of the beast set up, made. And uh, the, God's going to get this, this world in a, in a condition that he can judge it because the world is, is iniquitous. It's, it's not turning towards God and it's not going to. Only his people. And uh, so, you know, sometimes you can get the feeling like you know, uh, you know, the owner of the land's gone on a journey and he's going to be gone a long time. Well, he's been gone a long time, but he's nearing home. And so we want to be found watching and praying and we want, we want to keep our eyes on the things of the Lord right now. God bless your hearts. I, I, I love the people of God and I love this work of God. And uh, if you would pray for me, I'll pray for you and uh, the precious people of God. Uh, I appreciate what God is doing in your lives. Have a good night. And uh, I'll see you, those of you here locally in Little Rock. I'll, I won't see you uh, probably Sunday because I'm still uh, staying out, but I will be broadcasting to those of you that are listening from the Dominican Republic. We will have our Zoom uh, Bible hour, uh, our Bible uh, study Monday night at seven o'clock Dominican time. And that's the same as Eastern time. All right, God bless you all. Uh, this will be, if you didn't get to see the whole thing, it was recorded. It's on my Facebook page. You can go back and listen to the whole thing. God bless your hearts. Have a good night. Bless the Lord, Jesus. Touch your people.